we don't have an attention span issue because I know for me and for lots of other people, we could sit down and watch eight hours of a TV show binge watching on Netflix. Our attention span is not broken. It's just that we have no time for boring content. Welcome to the Content 10X Podcast. 10X Podcast. The show where content creators learn how to harness the power of content repurposing. And, and now, your host, Amy Woods. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Content 10X Podcast. I'm your host, Amy Woods, and this week's episode is all about how to create great video content. Now, if you've listened to me on the show before, you know I'm a big fan of creating video content, not only because it's really engaging and helps people to get to know you, but it's also a very versatile form of content for repurposing. But I know that it is not everyone's cup of tea and people get scared of creating video content. So I have a fantastic guest on the show this week, Mike Ganino. So Mike is a storytelling and communication expert who helps authors, experts, coaches, and entrepreneurs create signature talks that set them up with instant authority. When his clients talk, the world leans in to listen. Now, Mike hosts the Mike Drop podcast. He is the author of Company Culture for Dummies. He's been named a top 30 culture speaker by Global Guru. He's also the executive producer of TEDx Cambridge. So Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm a huge fan for a long time. Oh, thank you so much. (laughs) Well, tell us a little bit more. So, you know, we know that you help people be confident, share stories on stage, on video, but where, where did the, what's the background here? Where did this all um, come from? (laughs) What is the what is the origin story? You know, for me, I grew I grew up. I was I was a child of teen parents. My mom was fifteen when she had me, and I always, you know, growing up, the the like odds were not on my side. If you look at the statistics for like you know having teen parents, it's not rich wealthy people who send their kid to Harvard on a full scholarship. So the odds were never in my favor, and so I was always curious, like how do you get people to how do you get people to listen to you? How do you get people to uh, hear your ideas? How do you get people to make the things you want to make? Whether it's something simple like a school project or whether it's, you know, at work or in the world, you're selling a book or an idea. And I remember this specific moment when I was uh, in high school and I was trying out for the school class president, you know, like very important job, obviously. And I, I was like the perfect candidate for it. I was the national honor society president. I was Spanish club. I was the editor of the newspaper. I had like ideas about how to fix the campus and make things great. I had all of these things and the, but I was nervous. I was really nervous and I came across really like cerebral and really smart and sharing my ideas. And the person I was running against was just really popular and likable and fun. And she won and I lost. And I thought like, well, what is she going to do? You know, she was, didn't have any of those ideas. And I realized then that the person who, the person who packages everything up that they're sharing, that person is going to win, even if they don't have the best ideas. And we don't have to look very far uh, in the current global uh, political sphere, regardless of what country you're in to see that that's true the people that that can somehow weave a message. So I got really interested in, in rhetoric and messaging and how do we how do we communicate? And and that continued on through my career as a, a leader in the hospitality industry, as an actor studying uh, studying improv largely at Second City and, and those schools. And I realized that at the end of the day, it isn't about the best idea. It's about the best packaged idea. And so I became obsessed with helping people figure out how to take all the stuff they want to share with the world and put it into a message that people can hear. Oh, I really love that. And um, yeah, I, I completely relate to your story as well. I, I think there was a certain time where I was the same in terms of I realized how important confidence was and that it didn't matter, you know, so people who have these wonderful ideas, as you said, but then you'd see people who didn't have as good an idea, but they were just so confident and so great at putting it across. And it always used to annoy me. I started to notice that, I think, more at university in the early years of my career. Um, And it really dawned on me, you know, we're always kind of, uh, in the early stages, just pushed to be academically good and things like that. But the people who were going on to do really well in life had like confidence in a certain way that they held themselves. And, it, you know, it's maybe we all sort of noticed that at certain points in time or maybe I'm similar to you I, w- I always had the underdog story so like that maybe we noticed it more because <laughs> because of <laughs> right we were trying to yeah learn. exactly um oh no it's well thank you so much for coming on the show and that you know your background 
just makes you perfect for what I want to talk about today. So, um, so video content. So why do you think that it's great for people to create video content? Well, if you think about, if you, it's exactly what you were just saying too around confidence. If you think about the people that we, the people that we really trust, that we listen to a lot, it's people that we see, if you think about it, uh, we invite celebrities into our home every day. People like Kelly Clarkson with her talk show. Uh, people like, you know, Graham Norton with the talk show. We invite people into our home and we see them every day. And it's different than listening to like our favorite radio broadcaster. It's, it's different. You have to really listen a long time to really trust that person and really say, oh, I, I get it. Because there's something about seeing someone that means something to us. We, whether accurate or inaccurate, we believe as humans that if I can kind of see you, I'm going to get a good read on you. Are you being truthful? Are you honest? We believe in eyewitnesses for court cases, even though eyewitnesses have been proven over and over to be wrong because they are stressed out or tired or prejudiced or whatever the case is. Eyewitnesses are over and over proven wrong in court, but we believe them because we believe that what we see is what we get. And so if I see you on camera, if I see you on stage, and you seem confident, as you were saying, if you seem like you're telling the truth, that this matters to you, that you have excitement over this, then I'm going to believe you. But if I watch you and I sense that you are nervous, that you are hiding something, then I'm not going to believe you. And so we trust people that we see on video more than we would if we just heard them or just read their book. The combination of having really great ideas and being able to deliver them to people when they can see you is very powerful. And you know, I mean, the biggest celebrities in the world are people that we see, that we, we see them. It, it's, you know, people can certainly become an author, but the author has to do what? They have to go on promo to sell their book. They have to go on TV shows to sell their book because we believe what we see. Uh, and even back to the, uh, in 1960, there was the big election, the big debate between uh, JFK and Nixon here in the United States. And it was the first televised debate ever. And the people that listened to it thought that Nixon won. He was the known entity. He was, he was confident. He, was, he had been in politics a long time. He was the current vice president, so he was a higher status than JFK. But the people that watched it on television, the first televised one, they believed that JFK won. Why? Well, JFK was tan. He had a great looking suit. He looked healthy. He looked calm and he was very comfortable in front of the camera. Nixon had just been released from the hospital where he was sick. He was thin from losing weight in the hospital. He had a ton of makeup on and he had a suit that didn't look good. And he was clearly annoyed for having to be there. So when people watched it, they believed what they saw, which was, ah, this is, this is, this guy's going to win because he was so confident. People that only listened believed in Nixon. And so today where we are, the world is watching video. The world, there's no debate that everyone's watching video all the time. So if you're not showing up on video, you're missing a huge opportunity to connect. And if you do have an idea, if you do have a message that needs to get to people, video is going to get you there so much faster because people will watch it, they will trust you, and they can see that you really care, or at least that you can perform like you really care. Yeah. <laughs> and so why do you think it is that people do shy away from creating video content? What are the, the blockers that people get so scared and worried about that holds them back? I call it the three big lies. So I have this the three big lies of video, the fr and they're all psychological. I, I love approaching public speaking, performance, video work from a psychological perspective and not just a theatrical acting one, but really like what's going on in our brains and our audience's brains. So one of the things that happens, if you think about when you see yourself, you often see yourself in a mirror, right? So you wake up, you see yourself in a mirror. We get used to our entire lives seeing ourselves in a mirror. Mirror, uh, mirror reflection, mirror image. So when we see ourselves on video, and this is the thing all the time when I ask people in my workshops and webinars and things, and I say, raise your hand if you hate watching video of yourself. It's like every single hand gets raised to me. Every person is like, that's me, I hate it. The reason, one of the reasons why, one of the big lies is this thing called familiarity bias. We get so used to that mirror image of ourselves that when we see ourselves on camera, it doesn't look like how we're used to seeing ourselves. So it looks strange to us. It's like, ah, uh, is that, is that what I look like? Because that's not what I thought I looked like. I mean, even right now, uh, we're, we're looking at each other on video. And if we were recording this and I was to turn and look over to my, to my right and talk for five minutes, if I watch that video back, I never get to see myself from that angle. 
when I'm looking in the mirror. Because you can't look to your right and see yourself in the mirror. You never see that side of your face in the mirror, only on video. If you never see yourself on video that way, the first time you do, you think, well, no, that doesn't look right because that's not that's not what I look like because you're not used to seeing yourself that way. It's almost impossible in a mirror to see your whole image. As soon as I scan down to look at my waist or my shoes, I no longer see my face. But if I see myself on video, I can step back far enough that I can see most of myself. So the familiarity bias is one reason. It's just your brain tricking you and saying, something doesn't look right here. Something is wrong. The second one is the confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is the one that tells you to look for things that you believe are true. Again, you don't have to look very far in the current political world to see all of us fighting with our grannies on Facebook to know that we ardently look for what we believe is true in the world. <laughs> and so confirmation bias says that if you think uh, something is wrong with the way you look and who doesn't, I mean, who doesn't think something is wrong with the way that you look, that when you see it on video or, in fi or on uh, photo, you automatically look at it, you say, see, I was right. I do have a double chin. I am overweight. I don't look great. I am too short. My hair is bad. My eyebrows are crooked. Whatever your, we don't, none of us survive without some kind of issue in this way. Even the most beautiful and fit of us all have some kind of thing. Confirmation bias says that when you see it on video, that's exactly what you look for. It's kind of like, you know, when you're going to go buy a new car and you think, I really want a, uh, I really want a Volvo, you know, SUV. What do you start seeing on the road? Volvo SUV, because you're looking for it inside of your brain. The same thing happens on video. We start to notice our, I've been joking lately because I have a new baby that I've got the dad bod, but not in like the sexy way that people are like, ooh, what a dad bod. Mine is just like, I look like I'm the one pregnant carrying the baby right now. So when I see myself on video, Amy, I think, oh yes, I do need to hit, hop on the Peloton a couple more times a week. So that's the second one. The second reason, it's just our brain telling us, see, something's wrong. And the third one is this one that I call the social bias. And the social bias is about normally when we communicate, we are used to getting all kinds of feedback from social situations. So even if you're on stage speaking as a speaker, you're getting cues from the audience. You're getting, if you're in a networking event and we're just talking with a couple of people, you're picking up cues to say, should I go on? Should I slow down? Do they need me to repeat it? Did they like that? Do they want more of that? Um, and the, the higher level you are of a, of a performer, the more you're like, ooh, they like when I say something funny, let me give it to them again. When we don't have that on video, people don't know how to replace that. And so it ends up feeling really inauthentic because they're trying so hard to be authentic but they don't know how to replace those social cues. So those are the three reasons I believe we really hate ourselves on video. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And, and on the third point, um, I know that you've been helping lots of speakers to, and, and obviously for yourself, but speakers to pivot to from delivering on stages to delivering virtual keynotes and presentations. So what are you advising them in terms of how to change the talks where they would have fed off those audience interactions and cues that that isn't happening anymore. What's the kind of key tips there for how you you change your presentation style? One of the one of the quick and easy things that people can do, even if they're not a public speaker, let's say they're just producing video in general for some reason. One of the things is that when we communicate to someone on the telephone. So let's say that you get on your telephone and you're telling someone something without video, no FaceTime or anything like that. We tend to speak more clearly because we're really trying to make sure that the idea gets across to the other person. So when we're on the phone or when we speak on audio only, we try to really be clear because we know that they can't see us moving. They can't see our body language or our hand gestures. So we tend to be more clearly uh, clear with our words. We tend to take pauses more frequently. We uh, elaborate or we enunciate the words that we want to land. We do a much better job communicating that on the phone than we do when we try to produce video. Why? Because on video, we're trying to add it all together. It's kind of like, wait, I want to do my voice. I want to do my hands. I want to look at the camera. I'm trying to connect. And we lose the ability to be as clear as we are when we're on the phone. So one of the quick things I tell people to do is, so if you have a presentation, even if you're listening out there and you're like, I don't have a speech, but I, I'm going to give a presentation. I'm on a Zoom call or something like that. Slow down a little bit. You don't have to speak slower, but slow down your ideas 
like you were on the phone trying to explain it to someone. And that'll immediately make your ideas more clear to people. Because if your ideas aren't clear, they're not going to listen. Uh, the second thing that I always advise people when they're taking their ideas from like being on stage or being in person in a boardroom or whatever the case is to video is to remember that everything matters on video. Because in person, we have context. If you come, uh, if I come and see you, I've seen you speak at, at several events. I've seen the videos of it, uh, Amy. And so if, if I come and I see that you're speaking at an event, uh, there's so much context. I'm in a room with other people. We're sitting in chairs. You're on a stage. There's a, you know, there's some kind of stage dress around you. There's all of these social cues that tell me, pay attention to this person up there right? If we're in a boardroom having a meeting or presenting a proposal or pitch, there's all of these social cues, all of these contextual cues that are telling me, pay attention to this person. Because it's rude in that setting if I start clicking on my phone or looking out the window or something like that. It's, it's not, you know, it's kind of pathological behavior. But when we're on video, it's so easy to do that. It's so easy for someone else to tune into something else, to check a little email, to get a notification, to turn their screen off and read a book or whatever they want to do. So one of the things I advise for video production is to remember that everything around you matters as well. So what is the context you're putting yourself in? What is the story that you're telling with your background? What is the... Uh, and yes, your lighting does matter. Your microphone and sound do matter. Now... If you're just doing a simple call with a colleague to talk about a project, probably not. But if you're talking about a higher stakes presentation or pitch or producing a video for social media, all of those things around it matter because when I'm sitting here as a viewer watching, all I have is to look at all the things around you. If I'm paying attention to you on video, I'm noticing all the things around you on video. Think about the film industry, the TV industry. They're very good at doing this. They're embedding all of these ideas into the scene. And so think about what's behind you as well. What is the full story going on so that you can capture attention? So that's the second thing. And then the third and final one is just to, you have to really be in love with your idea. You have to really be in love with what it can do for people because you have to, in a room by yourself, like you and I both are right now, you have to be able to reach through that little camera and deliver it. So what are you What are you really excited about? Like psych yourself up before going on there. It doesn't mean you need to be, doing inter energetic gymnastics the whole time or, or be producing drama. But it does mean that you have to know that this idea that you have, this thing you want to share, it needs to go through that lens to the people on the other side. And once you have those three things in place, you're going to make a much better video than most other people would. Hey, just a little break from this podcast episode to ask you a question. Would you like one single place that you can go to that provides you with everything you need to be able to implement the best practices in content repurposing for your video content, your podcast episodes, and your social media content today? To help you get more value from the content that you create, get more time back, and help you reach more people than you ever thought possible. If so, then you are going to love the Content 10X Toolkit. The toolkit is full of video tutorials, templates, checklists, swipe files, step-by-step -step guides, and more that shows you how to repurpose your content in the best ways possible today. No more Googling, no more figuring it out yourself. We provide you with everything that you need to become a content repurposing pro. If this sounds like something that would interest you, then go check out the Content 10X Toolkit at content10x.com forward slash toolkit. Okay, I'm back to this week's episode. And how do you recommend in terms of the preparation? So when you are, you know, you're, getting, you, you're going to do a video and you're planning what it's going to be, um, at that preparation, preparation stage, do you recommend writing a script or how do you, um, how do you advise on doing the prep? Yeah, so I always do. Uh, I always do two. Th I do a bunch of things, but two things I do when I'm making videos is I'll outline like a quick little script. And I always think a good script for a video, not not a, although it could actually work for a webinar or a speech as well or presentation, but for a video that you're putting out into social, uh, the thing that I think really works is the same thing that you would see in uh, in television or something like that. It's hook them. So what kind of hook? What can you say at the top of it that scoops them in? The thing that most people do wrong here is they give their bio or they do their stats because they're, they're trying to earn permission. But what if you just showed up on video and you gave them a hook that showed your audience like, oh my gosh, I need to hear how this ends. 
I need that because I have that problem. For example, if I was doing one for, uh, for Captivate on Camera, which is a little workshop I lead, if I was doing a video for that, the hook wouldn't be, hi, I'm Mike Anino, and for decades, I've been on camera in front of audiences all around the world. I've trained with some of the best people here in Hollywood, New York, and Chicago. I wouldn't do that because I don't need to, and it's boring to you. What I would do instead is to say, you ever try to make a video and then you try and try and try and seven hours later, you were supposed to make a three minute video and you're still trying because that camera is blinking at you and saying, say something great, be amazing. I would do something like that so that the audience is listening and saying, oh my gosh, I need to hear what's in this video. Then I would give them a takeaway so that they have promise. So I'm gonna hook them and say, hey, here's a problem. I know you have, I have it too, or I know people who do. Then I'm gonna give them a takeaway that says, but you don't have to have that. There's a way to solve it. There's a way to be more confident, captivating, whatever the case is. And I'll show you how in this video. Now people are like, okay, I wanna watch this. Then I can go into my lesson and give the CTA. So I always map that out, hook and takeaway and ending. The middle sometimes if I'm, if I'm gonna go a little more impromptu, maybe I just put a bullet point, but I always map out my hook, my takeaway and my call to action for the end, which sometimes is not buy my thing or sign up for my list. Sometimes my call to action is, so turn on the camera and know that what you have to say matters. Maybe that's my call to action. Maybe my call to action is, so grab your phone and send a video to someone you love who you haven't spoke to lately. That might be my call to action. It doesn't always have to be buy my thing. It could be go change the world with your videos. So I always do that. And then the second thing, and you and I have spoke about this before, whenever I'm doing videos, when I'm doing webinars and when I'm planning presentations, I block off my content on little post-it notes or even on a piece of paper as questions. My agendas for meetings are questions. So instead of saying like, here's all the things I wanna talk about, what I do is I ask a question. So in the example I just gave about Captivate on Camera video, for the hook, my question might be, um, why is it so hard to be on video? Or what happens when people try to make video? That would be my question. And then I'm responding to that. So I put it up on my screen or on my wall, wherever I'm going to do it. And I see, you know, I can look up real quick. Okay, what, what, why, why, are, why is it so hard to do video? And then I respond to that. Great. Now I can look up again. I can edit out the lookup. Look up again. Okay, the next question is, so is there any hope for everybody? Oh, yeah, there's hope for people like you. And here's what it is. Okay, what is the big thing people need to do? So I believe that putting in those questions, and I even teach my clients when I'm working with people for video or for public speaking, for webinars, to build their presentations as a series of questions. You may never ask the question on camera, but the question being there is going to guide you into like, oh yeah, this is what I'm supposed to say. And it's going to come a lot more natural than a script. Uh, I think it's very hard for mere mortals who are not Meryl Streep to read a script and sound really great. So instead, I think, organize your ideas so you don't ramble. So put those questions up. R practice by answering those questions so you have something nice and clean, and then turn the camera on and just answer the questions. Uh, you're going to have something that feels much more natural. Oh, I completely agree. And and as you said, we, we've kind of engaged on talking about this because you put a post, I think it, it was a captivating <laughs> IGTV video that you put out and you were sharing this tip on the questions. And at the time, me and the team were, were kind of getting into the process of writing scripts for some videos that I do well kind of planning out the videos and you said that and I and the, the next day I was straight onto the team Mike Nino you know, said this it's genius and everything and we have it written in all of our like all of our documents now where we have guidelines at the top for how to write this script it says write the questions that you are going to answer and then formulate the whole thing based on answering questions it even says you know like you don't need to read out the whole question but you're talking about it, the answer so it's exactly what you said that was that's a, a brilliant tip and it, it just helps you to be more natural doesn't it because it can be quite hard and I think if you try and just read out if you try and rehearse something word for word um, or read out too much from a script or something like that it can just sound a bit wooden which I guess is a great lead on to the next question which is what are your great tips for being captivating on camera so you, you made the, the good point of it you know it's just you and people could start scrolling on their phones or they could go somewhere else so you've got a job of keeping people's attention what are the tips for that for captivating and keeping attention I mean the biggest the biggest things there are really 
we lose attention when so, think about what people pay attention to. There's there's this thing that people say all the time um, that we have the attention span of a goldfish or that our attention span is people is short. It's not true, by the way. No one's ever studied this thing. It's not true. And we don't have an attention span issue. Because I know for me and for lots of other people, we could sit down and watch eight hours of a TV show binge watching on Netflix. Our attention span is not broken. It's just that we have no time for boring content. That's the thing. I've got limited amount of time and I've got hundreds of hours of Game of Thrones to watch. Uh, you better be interesting or else I'm going to flip over and watch something else. We need to make sure that we're linking our message and our idea to their best interest, uh, to their survival, to their winning, to their entertainment if you're somebody who produces funny content or helpful content or emotionally dramatic driven content we need to link our idea to their survival in some way and so the number one thing that people do is it's just boring because they don't put in the time to really think about who is this video for what do they need to hear what would be the hook that would make somebody say "Ooh." This person has been watching me because this is exactly what I needed today. What would be that hook instead of all those other things? And then the second thing about it is really one of the things that happens so often, and this is why I don't love scripts for people who are not trained actors, is that scripts can be helpful, but then we need to get rid of it and, and really connect with our ideas and the people in front of us or the people we perceive in front of us on video. One of the things that happens is we change. Uh, I have a rule that I always say, no energy shift, meaning as soon as the camera comes on or as soon as you walk on stage, it shouldn't be like, oh, I'm someone new all of a sudden. And you see that sometimes where like it, it, someone, you know, before the camera starts rolling and you, you talk to a lot of people. So you see this, I'm sure, Amy, on the podcast, but there's like, a, okay, yeah, yeah, everything's good. I'm really chill. I'm just over here waiting things to start. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for this. This is a great show. And then the show starts so like, yes, hello, amazing, I love you. And it's like, where is that person? I think, especially on video and especially today, I think audiences can read that. I think your audience knows like this person's phoning it in. This person doesn't care. This person is worried about themselves. This person is trying to trick me into something. And so I always say no shift. Like whoever you were before is who you should be here. That we go on video and people say like, oh, I hate myself. And I was like, is that how you are? No, that's not how I am. Well, then you don't hate yourself. You hate this phony version of yourself. You're being on video. So who are you? And let's bring that person onto the film because I bet you, if you care about your topic, if you care about this idea and you care about your audience, you as you and not this funny, weird actor version of you is more than enough. And it's what people want. So no shift, be you, just be you in front of people on a lens. Those are like the big things I think people can do. What would you say to somebody who says to you, um, but I just don't really feel like I've got stories to share, but you know that they do, like you, you know them and you know that there's some great stories, and, but they're just, I, I don't have any stories to share. The biggest thing there is where we can find stories is to look back and say, what are the things that you claim? What are the things that you say? Because you weren't born knowing those things, right? I look at my, my brand new little daughter, Viviana, and I think, well, she doesn't have opinions on, on politics. She doesn't have any of these opinions. She's going to get these over time. And so whenever someone says, I don't have any stories, I say, okay, no problem. Probably you don't, but let's look through your script. Let's look through your content. Let's look through your values, your beliefs, the messages you share to your audience. So I'll look at someone's Instagram and see something they shared and they say, um, we can change the world if we just uh, drink more coffee. I, I made that up. That was a bad <laughs> idea. But, uh, but I think it's true. We need more coffee. So I would say, okay, well, why do you believe that? And then we go in and I say, well, when, w when did something happen to you that made you believe that? Because you weren't born believing that. And we can almost always find the story that way by saying the same thing like with companies. When I work with organizations and they say, um, we believe in putting the customer first and here's our value statement and our definition. And I say, sounds good. Can you show me, uh, like, when did that happen yesterday? Or when was a time that it didn't happen and things went really off the rails? So they say, oh my gosh, there was this time in you know, 2017, there's the story. So all of the places where you make claims, where you say something to be true, when you say, I know this is a fact, then what I would say is to dig in there and say, when did I see that to be true? How would I, what's my proof that that's true? What have I been through that makes that true? And there's probably a story right there for us. And the reality is for, for us, for the work that we do, for the types of folks watching this show, we don't need stories that are like elaborate stories of saving the world by climbing Mount Everest and meeting with aliens or something. We don't. 
what we're doing is more like personal essay type stories where it's like, well, just what have you been through and what did you learn because of it? That's what your audience wants. What have you been through and what did you learn because of it? Because maybe that could be helpful to me. And we all have those kinds of stories. Mm, I completely agree with you. And I think um, I think there's a piece of content I've been working on about how relatable will always be overly rehearsed. Um, and also like ready and raw almost will always be overly produced if we're talking about social media. And people sometimes get a bit hung up on it has to be a kind of Spielberg type uh, broadcast, you know, <laughs> like quality. And, and pe- but people don't go to uh, the kind of content that we create in social media and places like that for that level of broadcast quality and that level of rehearsed content, do they? Because overly rehearsed, but not particularly relatable, that's not what people go to the social platforms for. It kind of, it sticks out and it, um, well, like you said, then you really start to not particularly trust that kind of content because it's out of place if it's not, uh, if it's overly produced, overly rehearsed, et cetera, on the social platforms, isn't it? It's the opposite of why we're there. <laughs> <laughs> well, and one of the things that I've seen I've seen you talk about is is how geniusly all of the late night and daytime TV show hosts have done yeah. and what you teach clients to do. Take a large piece of content and break it up into pieces. I've read Content 10X, by the way. It's a great book, really helpful oh, to me. <laughs> and so this idea of like, okay, so Kelly Clarkson has this hour-long show. She's probably getting far more views from the little clips that end up on YouTube and social media. So we as, and, and those clips are not these long stories. They're little bits. They're little pieces of entertainment or content or helpful things. And I think for so many of the folks who listen to this show and the, the audience that that is drawn to you, Amy, is that we don't need to do those Spielberg shows. You're exactly right. Like if you're a YouTuber and you're doing travel videos, then yeah, you better have a good looking travel video because- there's a lot of travel videos. But if you're someone that's out there trying to help people in their business, trying to help people with their sales, what they want is honesty and truth and likability. And no amount of fancy cameras, no amount of fancy lights, no amount of any of those things, which is the first thing we all run to with video, right? We're like, ah, I need seven new cameras, 14 lights and all this. And then we can get home and we're like, well, who's gonna send the crew to work all of this? Cause I don't know how to use it. And the reality is most of our video issues can be fixed very easily, like by turning the camera and the light or or putting it on a book or something to get a better angle. What cannot be fixed easily is that whether you have something to say that's meaningful and helpful, that can't be fixed and that can't be hidden. So get rid of all the the dramatics and the fanciness and all of that stuff and just really connect with people with your ideas. Yeah. And I think you made a really good point before. There's some things to obviously think about, like your background. So um, don't have your, you know, your underwear drying on the clothes maiden over there (laughs) or things like that. And I'm actually saying that because I remember when I first got into online business and and digital content and stuff, I signed up to some webinar and and that, that was exactly someone was sat there with all of her underwear just drying behind her on a a clothes maiden um well think about your background you want to give off a family feel with family photos you want to come across all educated with bookshelves and things like that but you you know think about that don't you and you and your audio think about you know people need to be able to hear you and see you but it doesn't need to be overly techy and and it's an easy way to procrastinate isn't it if you if you think you need lots of gear you can procrastinate until you've got that camera or got that teleprompter or and you must see that a lot right (laughs) well I think it's a it's it's also in a weird way it's a little bit of it gives us something else to blame when the the video doesn't work instead of saying you know what I was trying to be someone else and I wasn't sharing, I didn't do the work to put together a great hook and a great takeaway. I didn't think about my audience. I didn't do what I needed to do there. It's much easier to blame the camera, the lights, the 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 uh, microphone. It's much easier to blame all that and think, oh, if I could just buy a good enough one, somehow I'll be famous. Here's the truth. I'm going to tell you some truth. Y'all can get whatever microphone you want, and you are not going to sing like Kelly Clarkson, okay? So stop being <laughs> trying to be that. Stop trying to be your favorite video producer and realize what your audience really wants from you as an expert, as a thought leader, as someone with ideas, as a business person, what they really want from you is truth and help. And if you could put those two in a video that is not boring, then you're gonna win. You're gonna win so much and it doesn't matter what camera you have. 
No. And I absolutely love the tip that you made of just be, still being you and not transitioning into this alternative. Because I was given advice once that was along the lines of you have to really up your energy even when you think that you're being ridiculously over the top be a bit more over the top because the camera saps the over the topness um and and I, but I found that so hard you know I, I just I felt so uncomfortable and so ridiculous Get, like be doing exactly what you said being normal me and then being all kind of like really kind of too crazy and that got me even more anxious <laughs> than just you know trying to be more natural so I think you know that that's such a good tip that um you you know just naturally continue to be yourself because trying to be something else on top of hitting the most important things as you said which is being true and sharing something that people want to hear and need to hear and is helpful it's just starts getting a bit too confusing <laughs> yeah yeah and you know yeah. that whole energy thing that people say like there is truth to it that sometimes on mm -hmm. camera you come across less energetic i don't think the solution is pump up your energy and be someone you're no. not i think the solution is figure out how to be more comfortable on camera so that you can actually look through the lens and connect with someone mm -hmm. that's the solution the solution isn't to like pump yourself up with caffeine and red bull and be some version of yourself because imagine this imagine that you were some like hyped up 10x version of Amy and then you actually show up for a client call and they're like what happened to the woman that was on that video because she yeah. was what was she imagine that it's like it's like I always make fun of real estate agents so they have like those photos of themselves from 30 years ago and it's like oh you haven't updated your headshot lately you don't want someone to watch your video and then meet you in person and be like oh you're better on video um, or to say oh I didn't really like you on video but I love you in person what you want is them to feel like they know you. That's what happens with, with celebrities. I'm going to go back to Kelly Clarkson here. But when you meet Kelly Clarkson, you get Kelly Clarkson, not like a different version. I'm sure as a celebrity, her home version of Kelly Clarkson is different. But when you just meet her in a casual setting, she's the same person that you see on these TV shows. And that is what your audience wants from you. It's your truth delivered and channeled to them through the lens. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, that's why there's certain celebrities that people fall in love with more than others, because usually you say, I could just imagine going for a coffee with them, or they just seem so natural. Like that's what people tend to say, isn't it? They seem so nice. They seem so natural. I could imagine doing things with them, like going for coffees with them and things like that. And so that's what we need to put across, isn't it? So that we don't, you know, I guess, like you said as well, kind of mislead people, It'd be quite awkward meeting someone at you don't want to, uh, to go to an event and people have been following you for years and then they meet you and you meet them. And then everybody says that, like you said, they're nothing like what I expected them to be. <laughs> right. Right. It's like, oh, that's terrifying. So terrifying. It's funny too, the thing that you said, the whole like, let's get a drink, uh, let's get a drink factor or let's um, get a coffee factor. It's one of the things that over indexes for people who are likable on camera, who have like that JFK vibe that I was talking about earlier during that 1960s election. When we see someone that we're like, ah, I could imagine hanging out with them because of their video, we give them trust and believe them even though they haven't earned it. And that could be good. That could be used for good or evil. As we know, rhetoric can be good or evil. So can theater. But when we see someone who seems like just real and natural, we over index their trustability. We over index uh, how good of a person they are, even if their ideas are horrible and even if they uh, have nothing interesting to say. So imagine what can happen for you if you're out there listening, if you could be likable, honest, real, someone I can go to the pub and grab a pint with, and you had really good ideas. Imagine mm -hmm. what you could do in the world. Yeah, absolutely. So two final questions, Mike. Um, the, the first one is um, to, to somebody listening right now and just completely inspired, not really created video content before, but this is it now. I'm going to go and I'm going to start creating weekly videos, let's say. What is the one tip that you would give to just get started, like the one thing that you think they should do to make that first step? The number one thing that people stop video from is that they feel like, I don't know what to make a video about. So what I would do in this moment where you're inspired, press pause for a moment after I say this, press pause <laughs> for a moment and write down 13 ideas, 13 things you can share with your audience that would be helpful to them. Write that down right now. Now, if you're going for weekly, 
then you've got 13 weeks of video ideas. That's the number one thing. If you want to add to that, then take those 13 weeks and say, what are the questions I'd like to answer about this? And now you've got a script. That's the first thing I would do. Cool. Yeah, I completely agree. <laughs> um, and so, and then I said two questions, but the last one is, so where can people go to, well, well connect with you, but also if you could just tell us a bit more about the, um, the Captivate on camera as well. So just where do you want people to go to find out a bit more? Yeah, so I'm easy to find once you figure out how to spell Ganino. Uh, so I'm Mike Ganino on the internet. So it's G-A-N-I-N-O. And uh, and if you type that in, I'm the one who's going to show up. It's a good thing of having a name like Mike Ganino. Uh, you can go to MikeGanino.com. And also I've got a little virtual kit that has some little tools, some, some little freebies there at MikeGanino.com slash virtual kit. Uh, and that's got some, some, you know, some free scripts and some pregame ritual checklist of like how to get yourself ready for camera, how to make sure you've answered the questions you need to answer. So that's over at mikeanino.com slash virtual kit. And, uh, and I love Instagram. So if you're on Instagram, come find me there. I love to, to chat and have fun and Mike and Nino there as well. Yeah, we'll put the links to everything in the show notes as well. So do check them out. Um, so yeah, great. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, it's been a great conversation. I've taken more tips away from you as I always do when we interact <laughs> um, so thanks so much Mike it's been really good okay so I hope you enjoyed that discussion thank you so much for tuning in if you enjoy the show I'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe if you haven't already and even leave a review that would be really appreciated as well now to let you know my new book content 10x more content less time maximum results is now available to purchase you can get that over on amazon or if you head to content10x.com forward slash book i'm getting loads of really great reviews coming in from the book already so thanks so much to those of you who have already purchased it and left reviews it really is the ultimate guide to content repurposing and you can discover all sorts of tips and tricks for how to repurpose pretty much any type of content in the book. If you're interested in our fully end-to-end -end content repurposing service, then head on over to content10x.com as well, where you can find out lots about that. And also give me a follow over on social media. I'm at content10x on all of the social media platforms. So again, thank you so much for listening to this week's episode and I'll catch you in the next one.